And welcome to another edition of Aesthetic Revolution, the podcast. I'm Dr. Ed Zimmerman, your host, and Stacey Taylor Zimmerman, my uh, esteemed associate who will try to keep me from crawling down rabbit holes while we discuss aesthetics from forehead to feet with kind of a concentration of what's in between. Today, we'd like to start a general talk on liposculpting. So suctioning, sculpting, surviving liposuction, and why do people do it, what it's like when they come in for their consultations, and what are some of the things that we discuss and try to educate people on so they can make better informed decisions about liposculpting and what it can really do for them or not. Big topic for you. No, big topic because we've been doing it over 25 years. You know, I started doing liposculpting not just with clay, but with humans <laughs> back in the late 90s. And things have progressed a long time. But historically, before then, a lot of people died when they tried to go, you know, core fat out of, out of overly fat areas. And there was a lot of bleeding. And, you know, it was not the very safe, relatively benign procedure that we are able to offer in the outpatient setting today. Now, we do all of our surgeries in a nationally accredited outpatient surgical facility. So we've raised the bar quite a bit from where many places still operate in glorified exam rooms. Um, but we're able to offer more because of that. But why do people come to us? Why do people keep coming to us to have their bodies sculpted? Yeah. Well, you've been doing it for so long. And I think some people don't realize that your practice was Las Vegas laser and lipo. And when you rebranded under and changed to Aesthetic Revolution Las Vegas, that was to encompass more of what you do because you don't just do lipo and laser, even though you, that's, I mean, you've been doing It all had to start lipo. somewhere. Yeah. You've yeah. been doing lipo probably the longest. And so obviously the, lasers well, as well. The, the, the lasers came even before the lipo, but right. the one thing led to another. And I think that's what happens when you grow up in an artistic family and you're allowed to spread into drawing and sculpting and forming and MacGyvering things together and all kind of fits after a while. It picks you. Right. But, you know, certainly the sculpting part and the rejuvenative medicine that comes from lipo because there's more rejuvenative cells, stem cells, stromal vascular fraction, and we can, that's a whole nother podcast that has come from lipo sculpting and all the fat grafting and the moving and shifting around and high def lipo, those kinds of things all came from more humble beginnings. And we've come a long way in order to keep those and make those safe and safer and more predictable. Yeah. But Let's talk about the, the average patient that comes in and then kind of what we go over in a consultation, because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about, you know, how much fat you can actually take off, you know, in one, one safely. surgery yeah. safely. Um, yeah. What happens to fat when you gain weight after you've had lipo. There's so many things that I think is a, uh, people aren't aware of before they come in for a consultation. So sure. we're explaining that. So, so lipo sculpting is based in science and you can safely get people to a certain amount of sedation or twilight and comfort with generally lidocaine um, a numbing agent. You can safely use so much of those kinds of things based on their general health and their body weight. So there actually are formulas that we use based on how many milligrams of lidocaine per kilogram body weight we can use on an average healthy people. There are a person, there are ranges to, in order to do that safely. And we want to stay on the conservative side of that. We've never had a transfer to the hospital. Um, because we've lived within that realm and, and we like to have a nice safety cushion. There are also formulas for how much volume you can take out of a human body and before you start getting fluid shifts so that you're not pumping, you're not oxygenating the peripheral tissue enough or the brain enough. So there, you can only take out so much fluid of the tumescent fluid that you use to numb somebody up and you can only take out so much volume at a time um, without putting them at risk. Now you can repeat procedures as quickly as maybe two weeks or two months, whatever. So sometimes you'll do serial procedures. And we certainly see that liposculpting has become mm, a procedure of the masses, if you will. And what used to be particular 
uh, single provider sculpting sessions, which is still my preference. I like having one person doing the marketing, marking and the, the artistic sculpting and the evaluations and the follow-up. I like having a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with my patient, but there are, I call them puppy mills sometimes. When you like, say one-on-one, -on -one, it almost sounds like you're one person. You mean you. You yeah. do all of that. Yeah, yeah I do all your, of that. Yeah, in it's our a practice, you me. do all of that. That's yeah, not... so in, in our practice, it's certainly a choice of right. me. But there are other practices that use teams. Right. And they'll have somebody who sells the procedure, then a physician who has to approve if it's medically safe, probably does the marking and directing, and then uses physician extenders to assist with the twilight and the sculpting. And then hopefully the physician comes in and does the fine tuning. But the physician may never see that patient again during their acquaintance with that uh, generally franchised facility or often franchised facility. Mm -hmm. And people generally do okay, but there's a, a big difference, sort of what you, you get what you pay for. Right. And if you want a unique, artistic, very safe, very comfortable, very personal experience, which is what I think liposculpting is all about, because we literally are artistically sculpting the body. Liposuction is not a weight reduction or weight control kind of thing, although it certainly has been used to help people off of a plateau or to start a body sculpting regime. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a proportioning thing. Mm -hmm. We use liposuction to proportion what mother nature didn't get potentially quite right mm -hmm. or what we feel is out of proportion. And so whether it's the jowls and neck or the male or female chest, the shoulders, the upper arms, the torso, the tush, the thighs, the calves. These are all areas. Yeah, yeah, I mean, with because with, the, the arm is connected to the armpit, is connected to the side of the chest or breast, is connected to the back rolls, is connected to the waist, is connected to the hips. And it, it's challenging when someone comes in and they have in mind, well, I want my upper arms done. Well, the upper arms are great, but they need to be looked at in proportion to the lower arm, or you can end up Popeyeing somebody. You make their upper arms too thin, right? And it's connected to the armpit. So if all those things don't blend together harmoniously, something looks done, right? And people come to us because it looks like they had a great weekend, hit the genetic jackpot, and they just naturally looked like they had the right proportions. And then you've got to think about, is there going to be enough skin contraction or is the skin flaccid? We want to figure out where we can hide our tiny insertion sites so they're within a skin fold or inside a little pigmented mole or where you've got to transition from a pigmented areola to a different color tissue. Um, along the lines of tension. And we want to artfully hide these insertion sites that we're going to use to slide our cannula under the tissue so that we can come from many different insertion sites. Because if you come from just one insertion site, as your cannula slides and suctions fat, much like if you were shooting pool in a snowdrift, you would shoot pool from one corner pocket and you would leave a groove if you only went back and forth from that one pocket. Mm -hmm. So now if you go to a 90 degree or so angle different, now your grooves cancel out the first grooves and back and forth using progressively smaller cannulas to blend the tissue and get a lovely transition of contour in a body. But those are things that you think about both from the practical point of view of, is this safe? Can I do this without sloughing tissue? Can I do this without losing too much blood or changing um, fluid shifts in the body and things like that. But those are things your physician needs to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about why people do liposuction. And, you know, where over 50% of Americans at least have some extra weight that uh, the universe didn't necessarily gift them. They just put it on by being bellying up to the buffet one too many times. <laughs> um, and so a lot of us have that. And, you know, it can be a mixed blessing. It certainly contains lots of stem cells. That's a whole nother podcast as we talked about. But, you know, if we want to artfully change the proportions of an area, we have to recognize that we have a hypothalamic set point 
that our body wants to maintain in terms of weight, in terms of the food that we eat and the exercise calories that we burn off. And just removing fat doesn't necessarily change that hypothalamic set point enough to make us maintain that weight. We can put the weight back on. We can take the fat cells permanently out of one area. And if you don't change the environment and the behavior, you can accumulate the calories again somewhere else. And it may be someplace that I can't get them. It may be instead of above the muscle on the belly, it may be under the muscle of the belly. And now we have a bigger belly, but I can't liposuction it. Mm -hmm. We've now deposited fat around the organs, which is medically more, more um, dangerous um, than having fat above the skin. Right. So there's, there's lots of things to consider in liposculpting. But in the ideal healthy person that was just gifted some fat in an area between the above the muscle and below the skin, that their parents gifted them and they don't want to have it anymore and they're realistic and they're not hugely above their ideal body mass index so we can make a difference for somebody long term then you know we can talk about what's it connected to because if it's a belly is it connected to the chest or the breasts above or the pubic area or around the back you know, when I first started doing lipo, we routinely did what they now call 360 lipo. Well, it never occurred to us to do one little area. Everything was part of the structure. Everything so was sculpted. 360 lipo is just a term that's come about more recently in marketing yep. as a marketing term. You've never not done 360 lipo. When you do lipo, it's a 360 version of it. So this is just a marketing blend. term. Yeah. If anybody's just doing a spot, they need to beware because just spotting an area would only be appropriate if you're taking it out for stem cells or you're taking it out to maybe a little bit to put in a tush or something like that. Normally, yep. if you're doing a full abdomen and upper breast or what have you, it's a 360. You're looking at the body. You're from looking the at the blended areas. Yeah. You wouldn't fill one cheek. Right. You wouldn't do laser hair removal on part of one leg. Right. You know, you're, you're going to treat the paired areas. And I think that part of this has come about because of the larger franchised lipo boxes have tried to keep things safe but keep patients relatively comfortable. And so they're only able to apply enough tumescent fluid safely and enough oral sedation because they don't generally use IV or IM sedation and put people on full monitors and still have them move around the way we do. If they're only able to do a small area, the right. upper abdomen or the lower abdomen or around the waist. So you're talking about some of these franchise uh, lipo places where they don't put you under. You're fully awake and they'll do one area because Technic they can't, I don't want to say technically, but they can't do any more than that. Safely or Safely comfortably. Safely or comfortably, yes. Because you can so, only take so many Valium or so many pain pills right. or so many whatever medication cocktail they can give you orally so they can do that without having to satisfy the recommendations for monitoring people with conscious sedation. Right. So you can have twilight anesthesia where you're still able to respond to command and to sit up and to stand up and to flex and to move and to really see how your sculpting is doing. Because we mark all these people standing up. Right. We do it in the mirror so they can see what we're doing and so we can all agree we're all on the same page. Then we can medicate them. Then we can fill them with a very dilute solution of anesthesia. We call it tumescent anesthesia to tumescent Which is to different fill. than what these other places do. The other places are doing something. They're not doing IM, which is an injection. They're only doing oral. Yeah, they're, they're just doing, doing whatever oral, oral pills right. you can take. Right. Um, and if you take more than what you would routinely take as an outpatient for relaxation or for pain, that is considered conscious sedation. And for that, you truly you require an accredited facility to do that safely and to do that within the statutes. So buyer beware. Yeah. Make sure you check out the facility that you're going to. And, and that, their experience you know, and stuff. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's all important. Um, you know, certainly it's when I was, important. when I was training early on, and I was one of the first 25 docs in the country to train with Alfredo Hoyos down in Colombia for high def body sculpting. And, you know, we certainly had, at, at that point, we were using full anesthesia. 
Yeah. And, you know, the patients were marked standing and then they were put to sleep by the anesthesiologist. And we all worked on the patient in order to sculpt the deltoids, the biceps, the triceps, the male chest, the abs, the anterior and posterior thighs. And, you know, then we would process the fat and very carefully put fat in. I mean, there are many, many steps to high def lipo. It's do it like doing traditional lipo sculpting three times in the same place. Which is another thing that seems to be a term that's more recent than 25 years ago. You've been doing the high def lipo sure. since then, yep. but that term has been thrown around more in the last, you know. Well, it's sexy. Right. And not everybody right. is truly a candidate for it because if they have any laxity to the skin, you've either got to use energy to shrink wrap the skin so it shows the cuts and the undulations that you've been able to sculpt, or you've got to pull the skin surgically and cut out the extra so that the skin actually shows what you're doing underneath of it. Right. So it's it's just like a sheet that drapes over whatever pillows, cats, whatever is underneath the bed sheets mm -hmm. that shows up as a uh, transition or a lump or a negative space, a shadow. Those are all very important. And we point out those things to people during their consultations. We get them into their underwear or some disposable underwear and a comfortable robe and we go in front of the mirror and go, let's look at what God gifted you and what you have in mind and see if the two jibe, mm -hmm. you know, if we can do this and we can do this safely or we can lay out a series of treatments where we can do this for you. So, you know, a lot of what we talk about when we do a liposuction consultation is first go into your history. Do you have any medical history? Do you have any contraindications, um, blood clotting or blood thinning or cardiac irregularities? Because lidocaine was used in the CCU to control blood rhythms, to control, sorry, heart rhythms long before it was, was, uh, used in these kind of quantities for numbing people. And it wasn't until, mm, golly, the late eighties, maybe nineties that debatably, depending on, on who you want to believe, but I'll say Jeff Klein is a very bright dermatologist uh, in California, an epidemiologist, did a series of studies where he determined what concentrations of dilute lidocaine with a little bit of epinephrine, which is a vasoconstrictor, adrenaline is epinephrine. And if you put a small concentration, one in 500,000, one in 1 million, one in 1.5 million parts, of adrenaline, it'll keep the very low concentration of lidocaine in an area that you're working with, and fat happens to suck up lidocaine. So we can use very dilute solutions of lidocaine with a little adrenaline that has been sweetened, if you will, the pH has been brought into a less stingy area with a little bit of sodium bicarbonate. And there are other things that can go in a tumescent solution, but those solutions are put into the fat compartment between the under part of the skin and the covering of the muscle, and it becomes profoundly numb. And once that sets up, which can take 30 to 60 minutes, then you can selectively um, put tunnels in that area and selectively remove fat from different angles, different insertion sites in order to sculpt an area and transition it to the adjacent areas that may not need sculpting, it just needs to be blended so it doesn't have a shelf. It so doesn't you, stop. So you were talking about the, in the consultation uh, any uh, contraindications that they might have yep. in regards to lidocaine. Yep. So tell tell me more about any other contraindications that you're looking for. Well, again, we 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 make sure that they're not taking a lot of blood thinners. So ginkgo, garlic, ginger, aspirin, Advil. CBD and THC, they're all very potent blood thinners. Mm -hmm. And we want people off of that for one to two weeks before we would consider doing an elective procedure like this. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to uh, measure the patients and take digital pictures and such. But after we do the procedure, they're going to be in a compression garment or garments. Compression in order to help push the skin back against the underlying tissue because you've taken a bunch of the tissue out and if you leave that unsupported, Mother Nature will try to fill in that space with fluid and basically scar tissue. It becomes woody and firm. It isn't moving and supple. You know, if you look at the human body, we're a series of planes that slide against each other and, and we're pulleys and pivots and things like that. And we need to leave those working normally. Mm 
mm-hmm. um, so that we don't have pulls and divots and, and uh, things that show when we're in motion. Because when we're static, it may look very smooth. But that's one of the reasons we like to put people through motion as we're sculpting and see what gravity does and what their muscle motion does to the contour of the tissues as we're sculpting. We can't do that when they're fully asleep. And we can't get enough done if they're pretty awake mm-hmm. um, because they're just too aware of what's going on. They can't do it comfortably. So we're doing, we're doing more artistic procedures when we're doing these things. But yeah, it has to be safe. They have to have supervision. They have to have someone to bring them to the office because they're going to start their medication at home before they actually come to the office. They have to have someone pick them up and watch over them until the drugs wear off the next day. Mm -hmm. And of course, we want to be able to stay in touch with them because they may not have a lot of memory of what happens at the office because of the drugs. You know, obviously they're, they're going to be there. They're going to be chaperoned. They're going to be fully monitored, but there's a lot going on that they may not remember. Mm-hmm. until their their brain kicks in again. And that's fine. Well, I think we've started yeah. this conversation, um, but there's so much more to talk about when it comes to lipo. Mm-hmm. So maybe we should do this in several parts. We yep. can um, talk more about the consultation and exactly what we discuss at a consultation, then maybe talk about some of the different areas that are most common that people are wanting to have lipo. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I think that you know we've been able to talk a little bit in this episode about lipo being an elective procedure, that it's a proportioning procedure. It's not a way of treating obesity. It's a way of treating tissue that's out of proportion and that it's a procedure where we have to be concerned about the container, the skin, whether it's going to contract around the new lesser proportions or whether it's going to need to be shrink wrapped with energy or it's tightened with uh, a little bit of surgery to remove the extra skin and things like that. And, you know, we'll get into fat grafting as well, because what you take is as important as what you leave and vice versa. And sometimes you have to put a little in to really make the effect. And that's where we're going with Brazilian butts and really artfully sculpting male and female chest and deltoids and things like that. And I think in this episode, we, you know, um, pretty much explained why it's important to make sure the physician you're going to has a lot of experience and, you know, the type of sedation you're going to be having and what they actually can do with, you know, their skills and their, their setup that they have there. So several things to look at. A lot of moving parts. Yeah. So we've kind of touched on that a little bit so we can continue to talk about that too. Cool. All right. Well, So thanks for tuning in for this episode of Aesthetic Revolution, the podcast, sort of an intro to suctioning, sculpting, and surviving uh, liposculpting from uh, forehead to feet. And we'll talk a little bit more about it with each episode. So thanks for tuning in. Like, look, listen, ask questions. We love answering questions. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.